Hello, 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 beautiful people. Welcome back to another episode of the U.S. Cell Show. We are hoping you are having a wonderful, safe, safe day um, as there's some weather rolling through for a lot of y'all. So be safe out there. Um, nothing as is, is as important as your health. I mean, well, maybe we are, but we're, your health is second. So keep watching if you go into the bunker, please get those views up. Um, so we haven't seen in a while, a couple of people we haven't seen in a while. I just want to say hi to you. Alan. Hi. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Hey. I'm in, I'm coming to you live from my uh, workspace. Um, not my apartment, but so that's why there's a scarf. Yeah. This is like decided to decorate this space instead of the space I live in because, yeah, <laughs> obviously, yeah, soccer, <laughs> soccer. <laughs> Ryan, how are you, man? I'm doing well. I made sixty six dollars on USL bets over the weekend, which I then turned around to buy office shoes. So, uh, not encouraging you to uh, bet to have your bills paid for, but it's one way to make money. Um, I think uh, Ipe said that at one point. Um, so, anyway, uh, <laughs> Phil? <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm good. Um, I got a reprieve in, uh, you know, I got to enjoy uh, an Easter weekend with no locomotive to ruin it for me. So, um, yeah, very feeling very blessed. I wish I could say the same, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just out here living life. I am still beating the drum for uh, CBS. Do please put me on the broadcast. I'm here. I'm probably a short little train ride away from the studio to talk about the Indy 11 game. So executives who aren't watching, get me in the mix. Um, If there's any executives watching, hi. First off, <laughs> thank you. Why are you here? <laughs> Just put, put all of us on Galazzo. Yeah, if you're actually watching, put all of us on Galazzo, please. Well, yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm here for it. Um, speaking of, we are now, I can, I feel like I can give a little bit more away now. We've been talking about a live show and. We are officially in the works of going out to the live show. So we want you guys to be aware of what's going on. We are looking to go out to Oakland versus Sacramento on July 20th. Okay. So we need to raise funds for this. We're going to be coming out with some new merch somewhat soon um, to try to raise funds for that. But also sponsors, if you are someone who wants to sponsor the show, we we have pretty reasonable rates. I'm going to be honest with you. So reach out to us, the USL show at gmail.com. And also, I would like to just go ahead and thank uh, Stephen, Jeremy. Uh, congratulations on uh, the new family member, Jeremy, by the way. Alberto, Noah, uh, Michael, Joshua, Joshua, John, Christopher, Aaron, Frank, John, and Harry. I will get those scrolling updated very soon so you'll see your uh name there again uh yeah so all that said we are trying to get out to oakland and that's what we're uh planning right now so if you want to help us a the patreon will be amazing but also if you know anybody that just wants to get their brand out there just a little bit that would be cool too Anybody have anything on this? Anything else? I like, I can't even begin to describe how dope this would be. Um, and, uh, and anything like, I don't know, like o Oakland roots do ve some very cool things, but yeah, this would be, this would be pretty unbelievable. And like, I think this is, uh, something that USL teams like, at times are reluctant to do in terms of engaging with like independent media. And I love the idea of, uh, yeah, partnering with more teams like this in the future. If this one goes well. Oh yeah, for sure. Also just, even if it doesn't work out, I just want to say, shout out Tommy. I love you, dude. You're the best. Um, 
So shout out Tommy from Oakland, by the way. Just Best Everton fan there. I've ever I've ever Tommy's out had. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy's out there doing everything right to build that club, to build that community. Like, I mean, if we could be a small part of that effort, that would be unbelievable. So any support helps. For sure. Hey, so kind of speaking on commu building communities, there's about to be, I think some louisville some people in louisville and indy and in 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 indianapolis it's easy for me to say that might be finding out that they have a professional soccer team for the first time a men's professional soccer team anyway and that's because it's going to be on cbs not cbs galazzo not espn2 cbs and correct me if i'm wrong but this is about to have a final four lead in right the final four is on TBS uh, on Saturday. Uh, so that well, we, the more important game is on the more national broadcast. <laughs> true. Very true. But yeah, I mean, I when I was watching the Elite Eight and I saw the, I'm not even going to try to do it, the L I A P or no, L I P A F C. Right, right. <laughs> there we go. Yep, yeah, you got, got there. there. Yep. Yeah. On like CBS, I was taken aback because I saw the the Louisville Stadium and I was like, "Why is that on my TV?" And that's all Louisville City, and I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> and I was, I, it shocked me. It's so cool. It's like, yeah, yeah again, I mean, just it, like we've stuff. been talking about it a lot. Like, there has go for it. No, you got this. <laughs> John, John is John is in hell. Uh, no, it, it, it like like John said, like we've been talking about it, and uh, I think the the overall the the message here is one, like you said, Kayler, like this is visibility that USL just hasn't had um, at, on network TV. This is the like. People are going to be finding out um, that these teams exist. And I think in general, the the amount of the level up that is going on with the CBS partnership is is truly like next level for USL um, and getting a regular season game and not just a not just a final on CBS is is uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be awesome, especially when you think of like these <laughs> like some of the viewers are, are referencing when you think about the youtube days like they are not that far like not that far removed from just being on youtube and now they're going to be on network television it's kind of insane uh, and with cbs like they have a history of of doing well with soccer right they put a good product out it's a place where people are starting to to end up for their soccer coverage and it's very uh, i want to say eclectic it's got a group of people who are knowledgeable who are engaging who are super fun like they bring alexis guerrero in like they do it well and do it right and so to have a place where usl the land that isn't just an afterthought like sometimes espn certainly feels that way um to have it on on big boy cbs is a step in the right direction because they're gonna have to you know get a foothold in somewhere especially with, you know, the Super League coming to, to find a place for USL to get national broadcasts. And it certainly won't hit the reality until we're starting to get uh, previews for the Masters happening the following weekend, and we get to hear the now Big Ten football theme song accompanying uh, the Louisville broadcast. John, are you alive? <laughs> Yeah, I got to sort out some audio real quick, but I'll be good in a second here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, you know, talking about the kind of lead in to that, um, by the way, CBS is putting ESPN to shame with soccer coverage. Yeah, the one thing I kind of always want to bring up with this, with the CBS as well, just the broadcast quality. And I've kind of talked about how their other sports that they do, they have done just a perfect way of filming their actual cameras that they use. They've done a very good job of investing in the correct equipment. And you can tell 
just visually you can tell. So, yeah, I am. So, a DCFC versus North Carolina is leading in on CBS Detroit here in Michigan also. I mean, every team that has their, like, CBS, ABC, Fox, whatever affiliate, you know, leading in, like, Legion have a local affiliate, which is cool, but there's something about a truly national broadcast that are about to discover the second tier for for the first time ever is really cool. One thing that I think is pretty neat about it is I, I can't remember where the tweet came out. I saw it on I saw Ben Goshorn um uh quote tweet it and it's basically like this is a monumental moment in American soccer history and it sounds like one of those cliches that what was the one that uh when they said when where they announced CBS what was the it was a monumental moment it was something like that but truly it is because think about the last time you remember a matchup between a second or third division team being put on national broadcast don't even think about American soccer. Think about the second or third division of college football or, you know, like, or basketball there. If it's not D one, it's not on national, you know, broadcast like that. It's not on network television. That is truly monumental. At the same time, I think it's important to contextualize it relative to U S soccer. Like, Think about the last time MLS had a game that was on national TV, right? Like they've been buying the Apple TV paywall for going on two years now. Sure, they were on ESPN, but how often were they on ABC? Like this is a unique thing that the USL is doing that's really going to benefit. Well, you know, kind of talking about building community, um, I kind of – this basically, this next little bit is we are talking about Kentucky, the state of Kentucky. And I just kind of want to briefly mention the, there's some people that are kind of up in arms. And I want to do this high and tight um, over FC Cincinnati too. Um, they have a team that plays out at Northern Kentucky University. Um, and they are, think they are rebranding it to, I think it's Commonwealth United. And there's a lot of people who are kind of upset about this because they're not being called FCC2, which I'm just going to get my personal opinions out of the way. I don't really think that affects either USL market whatsoever because Newport is quite literally directly across the river from Cincinnati. Those people were going to Cincinnati games anyway. It's not like they're going to be losing any possible – Louisville City or uh, uh, Lexington Sporting Club fans from this area, that whole area would have been going to Cincy anyway. So I don't think that's a big deal. I think the issue tends to be when you rebrand these two teams and act like they are independent entities, whether it's with Ventura County, uh, what we've seen with some of the affiliations elsewhere, it's getting away from the fact that these are just youth development teams. Like these don't have an identity. They oftentimes don't have a supporters culture yet. You have to say you throw them up in the U S open cup. If you see Ventura County against Irvine Zeta, that looks like a legitimate game when it's actually MLS kind of Trojan horsing their affiliates in, in the service of a larger goal that is ultimately not good for American soccer. And I think that the team names, why they seem small, are kind of that step into more nefarious things. So I'm with you that like on the small level, Commonwealth United, cool, whatever, doesn't affect anything competitively. It's part of a larger trend of action where I'm not going to say like MLS is gaslighting everybody, but I'm not not saying that. (laughs) The minor, the minor league baseballification of minor league soccer, quote unquote, I think it is like, like John says, it's tiny. It's tiny steps in a more in a more broadly nefarious direction. Where, yeah, get getting upset about the one team seems weird, but I think the trend that has emerged, where they're just renaming all of their two teams, um, that that feels a little bit more um, 
yeah uh, a little bit more nefarious seems like such a harsh word to use like yeah. for <laughs> something about sports but it does it does feel a little underhanded um and it feels like a sales pitch to local supporters that hey this is a local team like the same as these other local teams when it's not the same so i think that's more so the concern and you're already going to see that just more and more frequently as MLS sides try to push their B teams out into other markets. And uh, you've already even seen some teams such as Crown Legacy and Charlotte as just renaming themselves and still staying within their own market as well. And it's just more a worrying trend on where MLS is trying to point their brand of soccer within the United States. Very, very, very astroturf. I just, I guess for me, okay, I guess this is bigger problem. And I guess I'm just summing up the issues with American soccer. I guess it, the, the minor league baseballification, if you will, like you mentioned, Phil, it, this is their own development league. So it technically is their own minor league teams. So, and so I don't see a problem with that if, you are thinking about it in the scope of major league baseball, minor league baseball, because these are their, these are their actual minor league teams. If you're not looking at the two independent teams in the league. Well, and that's, I, and that's where it starts to get tricky is I think like with the inclusion of the independent teams for like quote unquote legitimacy, where it's like, you're hiding sort of you, you're like, but look at Chattanooga and, in reality it's like they played huntsville city it's like no they played nashville reserves like that's what happened um but you're sort of hiding it all under this like varnish of legitimacy so i think if they were strictly if they just came out and said hey we're rebranding all of our reserve teams and here's all of the like this is how they all are and this is going to be mls next pro is going to be strictly a reserve league like they've said that they want to add more independent teams to MLS Next Pro. I think the idea is to try to poach teams out of League One and like p take potential expansion off of USL. I'm probably being a bit cynical, but at the same time, it just feels like that's more so the the broad goal um, is they want to continue to extend the reach and kind of make it look all the same um, because then it's like, we're all sort of having this argument of, well, what's the real like lower league soccer. Um, and the average person isn't really going to care um, or like see beyond sort of the surface level thing. Yeah. Just to piggyback once more real quick, like when you see the fact that likely there's going to be a DC United affiliate in Baltimore, like taking up what should be a prime USL market, you think about LA galaxy too, and that rebrand, like that was a team that in the very recent past was trying to just take Orange County SC stadium. Like the fact that these teams are, or rather these leagues are kind of in conflict at this point and MLS is being a little bit wry on how they want to position themselves. That's the reason for warning, even though like in a vacuum, Commonwealth United, whatever, cool beans. Fair enough. Hey. And Killer, you should know you can't keep that brief when you've got two veterans of the soccer wars on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm watching the NYCFC two US Open Cup game at Belson Stadium. Like I've got PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, so let's talk about one rebrand to an expansion. And let's talk about Buffalo. Buffalo is allegedly coming into the championship market fc buffalo's already there and super cool fc buffalo came out and said hey that's awesome man can't wait to be involved with it same thing that we saw with oh gosh it was was it for no it wasn't for lauderdale oh no it's one of the it's one of the florida expansions that we just got naples naples got there um with naples united basically saying we love this for our city. We love this for our area. Cannot wait to be a part of it. So I think when you already have the buy-in from FC Buffalo saying that we are a part of this, I think that makes the wars feel a little bit different because it's actually an allied front on building not even just a pyramid 
within the U.S., but also kind of a pyramid within their own city of you can work your way from the grassroots of your local club and then maybe be in tandem with the professional club in your own backyard. And Buffalo is certainly a region of the country that the USL is familiar with having uh, had their roots within the former Rochester Rhinos as well. So it's another market that I think think would at least fit within the overall kind of uh, geographic footprint of growing this New England area. Yeah, and just with some of the specifics of Buffalo, and given the fact that the Rhinos, like in the early aughts, were drawing 10,000 fans a game, this is clearly an area of the country where soccer can flourish. I think the leadership with Peter Marlette leading that group is incredible to see. He's somebody who did a fantastic job really shepherding the Union Omaha project on and off the pitch. Uh, and he comes from the Buffalo area. He played for FC Buffalo for a couple of years. I think if there's something interesting with Buffalo and Roswell, it's been the way that they've handled the ownership or lack thereof. There's not really like an announced majority owner of this club. Like there's not a money guy who has publicly shown his face. That's the same thing that we saw in suburban Georgia, where the USL entered into a letter of intent to kind of pursue this project with the city. We're not really sure like what the backing is. It's a very exploratory way of going about expansion. And while I'm completely sold on all of the personnel and the market itself with Buffalo, I am a little bit concerned of the way that they're staking the claim in these places that maybe some of the infrastructural steps aren't in place and maybe the announcement comes soon, but it just reads a little bit odd when that's what you're seeing with the uh, kind of first round of PR. Also, we did an interview with Peter and so therefore I'm rooting for him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think, I think it's a slam dunk in terms of location like like john said i think there's just a lot of unknowns there's the the ref the vague reference to like the buffalo mayor is supportive of it is just so like it 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 is still leaves it very open-ended so hopefully um hopefully they can nail down some of the specifics particularly around the stadium because i think that is just going to become more and more of a sticking point with usl championship teams in particular like making sure that they own their stadium and are in control of their stadium situation i think is just going to be like such a prerequisite for future expansion so i'm hoping they get it right because i do think that uh if if done right this team can really can really be big in buffalo anybody else on this all right so Let's, unless, John, did you have some? Nope. Okay. Let's go ahead, and I want to just hit a couple of things within the, uh, well, the Bluegrass State a little bit more. And let's talk about, if you haven't watched it, just go back and watch all of the Lexington versus Greenville match because it was everything you want as a neutral and more it it was just a fantastic neutral watch but uh lexington looks like they figure it out but jamie smith seems like he hates lexington kentucky and just always seems to pop up (laughs) against them and amal knight gets gets sent off and we'll see Uh, uh there's everybody said it's harsh but there's nothing you can do about the scent, apparently. And so that one kind of is what it is. And yeah, Greenville come out with a three to two win, just a bonkers game. I know, I know the refereeing is like, uh, going to be a, a point in this, a big point in this game, but I do, I do want to say first and foremost that, who would have thought that Sebastian Velasquez coming off like would reveal Ben Z- Zakowski, who was absolutely electric? <laughs> like he wasn't just like making up the numbers. This kid is 
ridiculous. And obviously the goal stands out in terms of like the technique on the back heel, but he was so involved in everything good going on for Greenville. So I just wanted to call that out before we dive into all the controversy because like, man, what, what a, what a talent it seems like they have on their hands. And I mean, for him to just be sort of like a good college play like he was just a very very good college player um but never you know wasn't hyped like to any you know ex 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 insane degree or anything like that seemed like a guy that and and then to see what he did against lexington um yeah just really impressive um he uh yeah he he looks the business as they say i think that's kind of the beauty of the greenville model and it's why they've been so successful year in and year out where I mean, this game it's in and of itself was a showcase, right? Of Lexington is the team that went out and got a bunch of guys with championship experience. Greenville has stuck with the same defensive core and what they build around it is guys who put up some good advanced stats at kind of under the radar colleges. And hey, I mean, it works for them time and time again. There's a lot of controversy in this game, obviously with the sending off I mean that the long throw at the end like that's crazy stuff to see in such a unique situation this was a game on golazo as well if i'm not mistaken so i th like credit to league one for getting that platform and putting out for any neutral or like someone who just stumbled onto golazo what an introduction to usl league one and the havoc that you can get uh, so yeah i mean a lot to take away from this one for sure I mean, Greenville, even up into the red card that they had against Lexington and still had 21 shots on the match and then five after uh, the sending off. So it was still a very impressive display from the triumph out of this game. And it was uh, basically it just kind of showed again that Greenville is a, a defensively great system and they know what they're doing. I think I think, too, though, like with this match, Lexington did show what they are capable of and i mean the talent that they have at the top end like is truly capable of the ridiculous like in and they were at times like torching greenville even even though greenville i think played overall well particularly the second goal i mean it is just like it shows what this lexington team can be um and i think overall yes there is like a lot of there's a lot of strange things at the end of this game um but i don't think of the losses like that lexington have suffered you know early on in the season i don't i don't think i walk away from this one as like uh what are lexington like doing uh you know as much as i i was maybe in the first where it's like ah, oh, they're still really figuring it out it seems like it is clicking in a couple of areas and yes, they've definitely got to like get it together at the back and you you're dealing with the sending off. But like, I would say overall, if I'm a Lexington fan, I'm probably walking away from that <laughs> after the dust settles, I'm probably walking away and thinking like, uh, we're, we're probably going to be okay. Yeah. I think, um, the only thing wilder would have been if the keeper did a touch on the ball and it just goes in the back of the net from the throw in and everyone thinks they won, but then they call it back. Because it's just like, that was what was going through my mind immediately was like, Oh crap, this could have been even more chaos. Cause they thought they had the winner. And uh, yeah, I think the theme of some of the teams this week is like, there's a lot of promise. Yeah. You might not have pulled off a win or you might not have even gotten a draw of teams that you can start to see how they're going to play. And there's some positive things to come out of a loss. Um, and or key takeaways you're like we need to fix this one thing and we might be pretty good um, and I think this is one of those showcases where you can you can see some of the teams starting to put some stuff together and it's it's a long season and it's not the Premier League so you, like you can tinker a little bit you can you know go from last to end of playoffs and then then it's all a new season uh, so no panic buttons, I don't think. Are be are panic buttons aren't being pressed for very many places right now, as they shouldn't be. Um, but I think it, with Lexington, that's one of them that you, you can start to understand how they want to play and see that they're going to be a pretty fun team to, uh, to keep an eye on this season. The one thing that we kind of had questions about um, was could Darren Powell have a progressive offensive system 
I mean, overall, we've seen his teams in the past be uh, in the terms of negative, meaning defensive, right? We, Whenever we say a negative system, I don't mean it's a bad system. It's a defensive system. And you're kind of relying on Cameron Lancaster to be Cameron Lancaster, which, by the way, full credit to him for not just dropping down a league and treat it like it's supposed to be a walk in the park. He looks like he's trying just as hard, if not a little bit harder than he did in Louisville his last year or two. Like it he took that he's taking this very seriously and big ups on him because it looks great. But also you're looking at Dioff who has not been involved this year. I, I know he was in this game, but as a total, just not. And he was the guy that I thought was going to be a shoe-in for Golden Boot this year. You, you kind of have to wonder if Darren has to sit there and say, yes, we brought in 17 center backs, but also we have one of the best attacks in the league. Why don't we just send it? Because their center backs are good. They can rely on, you know, making a couple of mistakes, but them playing so negative means they're constantly on the back foot. And it's bound to have mistakes happen when you are just on the back foot for so long. Yeah, you'd love to see them try and kind of evolve that style in a way. When I saw the roster construction, I frankly thought a back three was going to be the choice. And you can imagine, right, like if you put Corrales at one of the wide defensive spots, that's an excellent passer and ball carrier for someone ostensibly playing center back. I think the wing back role is really suited to Tate Robertson as opposed to being an out and out winger. I, I think there's a lot to be said for how that would suit this squad. Whether Powell goes that way... It remains to be seen, but if Lexington keep failing to get results like this, it's going to be something to watch. And maybe they just practice set piece defense and it gets fixed. And that's a real possibility here. If you watch that Vermont game where they gave up the same goal a handful of times on uh, the same corner routine. But I'm just a little bit, and I know we've talked about it a lot, probably too much, but I'm just a little bit concerned about Lexington. So um, speaking of being going from being concerned to outmost confidence, go ahead and take the interstate of, what is it, about an hour and a half and go over to Louisville. My word, I'm just going to throw it out there. You could probably easily say best team in the league right now because, dear God, they put a five spot on Legion, and it could have been a lot more. Our, Can you just talk about how you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> no. I was literally about to say, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> um no <laughs> i i left as soon as the game was over i kind of laughed i went to an easter block party to get my mind off things and one of the and one of the guys that's in like our young adult church group was like hey i heard you like soccer you want to go out there and kick and i was like no, <laughs> no, <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> I hate. I thought I was gonna. Stupid sport. <laughs> I thought I was gonna be like the meme where you're like just standing off the side. I was like, they don't know my team got pumped five nails. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all seriousness, Lou City, my God. Um, he was not up for player of the week because his stats weren't there, but Perez might have been the best player in the league last week. He was ridiculously good. Wilson Harris gets the brace and gets taken off with 20 minutes to go. Didn't get his chance at a hat trick, but seriously, I mean, Lou City looked incredible. They... Yeah, I mean the way that they were able to play through Birmingham, like it it was really just very easy for them at times. And I I I think there is probably some conversation to be had about Legion's midfield and just how Where? bypassable Where they it? were. <laughs> or yeah, how <laughs> how absent they were. Um do you, do you want me to get up the heat map? <laughs> that being said, that being said, I do think um, I think we may have underpunched like just how good this Lucidity team can be. Like, I think we all thought that they'd be up towards the top of the East again because they they did feel like they reloaded. I don't know if we were all ready for what Ray Serrano is bringing 
like in terms of output i mean he gets the the one goal the one assist but i mean he's involved in everything and for a guy like sort of breaking through amidst a more star laden if you will like louisville roster um yeah he just looks absolutely unbelievable and i think on form there's kind of no stopping like this lucidity team because they have so many different weapons like you mentioned perez doesn't even register like in terms of the score sheet um because harris and serrano are on the end of the you know so it's just like where do you even begin to try to stop that that lucidity attack um it's it's they've they've been ridiculous but serrano for me is just like such a standout um and and uh, a good surprise if you're if you're a louisville fan with just how much just how involved he is Serrano is such a fascinating one. He was a guy who was like a right wing back with Tacoma. He broke out as a teenager. He came into Louisville and they immediately moved him into the central midfield. So seeing him grow into this wing position where he's constantly like tucking inside to get touches, facilitating play. He's a menace in the press. And you hit the nail on the head as well with Perez, who really has been out to sea a little bit in the first handful of games, like been the least impactful member of that front line he felt like he found that flow against Birmingham. And there's a lot to be said that the Legion have been kind of putrid in every single game defensively, like not to rub it in outside of Matt Van Ockel. Not they've putrid. Been, they've been dire. Like. <laughs> no, but I mean, Lou City just deserves so much credit for going out and getting the pieces that would make this team that much better. And I would argue there's still room to grow. Like they're starting Jansen Wilson, who just graduated from college, and Jake Morris, who like played six games on loan for Loudon last year at the wingback spots. They're gonna turn that into Amadou Dia and Sam Gleedle at some point and just be a weapon. So it's insane this team can continue to get better. And this equals their for the third time in club history, they've begun the year with nine points from three games. If they can uh win this weekend it will equal their best ever start in club history i think this louisville city side is going to be one of the uh petitions to start counting hockey assists in in soccer because guys want their stats because <laughs> there's just going to be guys playing the ball into good spaces or making really good runs to like touch it off to a guy who crosses across and scores and like the guy who did all the work is going to get zero of the credit so they're going to start petitioning the league uh, for hockey assists. Um, yeah, this game, uh, much like um, Birmingham's midfield, I kind of stopped halfway through. I was like, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I can watch this anymore. Um, it it was... actually got an NC-17 rating from this. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, and as a fan of soccer, like, you have a team... like. Sure, there are certain teams that have probably never been through this, but I think as someone who's watched sports their entire life, you have a team that you've seen. I mean, I live in San Diego. Like, the Padres do this all the time. Um, that it's just like, how can we dig ourselves out of it? But you have to have faith that at some point the team will figure it out. Um, it might be next season. Sorry, Kaylor. Um, But, yeah, that was it was rough. But it's still early, right? Like, you're not out of it. You know, you can put in a nice run at the end of the year, maybe find a midfielder or two. Um, there's still hope for you yet. This is like the um, this is the Empire Strikes Back part of your trilogy, Kaylor. So you just got to, like, get your hand Kay cut off and frozen in. <laughs> yeah, Kaylor's frozen in carbonite. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll roll him into Oakland. Just... <laughs> the, I mean, Kaylor, look on the bright side. The Birmingham Stallions won this weekend. I don't care about the freaking stallions. <laughs> and, not, and not and not not me just like <laughs> Thank God we got a bye week. Look, uh, you you say we can mm, the same things that were an issue last year are an issue again this year, but they're worse. They have worse strikers. They the midfield is worse. They didn't replace anybody. Um, and 
th- there's a lot of factors. It's not from the lack of trying, but they didn't replace anybody. And the people that did replace have just gone missing. Like, people yeah, where didn't is know. Tore? Where is Bura? I, well, listen. Mama Boya Tore, at, at some point when he, at other clubs, has also randomly gone missing before. <laughs> this has also been a thing. So I don't know if he's actually gone missing, but the club hasn't told us anything. This is also the same guy that skipped his own wedding to go to training. So I don't know. Um... Hey, well, at least yeah. <laughs> at least he didn't leave his family to go play in New York. <laughs> so, New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey, yeah, my bad. I <laughs> built different. I, do we think do we think that um maybe he thought he was signing for Birmingham City and That's even worse. <laughs> got upset when he found out that he was in Alabama or like I mean probably i mean i'd be a little i mean uh granted behind I mean, birmingham england seems like a decent place actually i don't know i, I don't know look can I, I'm, can I can i lob one more legion question your way yeah why are they doing the I thing don't where... <laughs> <laughs> why is kavita playing wide while cronale is in the middle what's the i don't there? know so when they played Atlanta United, they had Cronale at wide, and he was yeah. the one getting up. Him and AJ Patterson were the ones getting up and down the pitch. And I think that they were worried about Patterson and Cronale both going up forward because they're both players who want the ball at their feet. So they are. I think they're forcing Alex to stay back because his tendency is to go forward. The issue is, is that sometimes they go to a makeshift back four with Fanwell Cavita playing right back and Kobe Hernandez Foster playing center back. And it's weird. I don't think it's really a plan. I think it's more or less forcing Alex to stay back and not go up because they want AJ to be the ball carrier and it's not working. Yeah. Like, I mean, I won't get, keep like digging in this ditch for the Legion, but I, I think a lot <laughs> of the decision making right now has been pretty baffling. Yeah. Um, I by the way, I have it up here. Um, the 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 heat map. If in case you're wondering, there are two holes here where you would expect a central attacking midfielder and a defensive midfielder. I don't mean light spots. I mean literal holes. Like you see grass. Yeah, there's grass there. Zone 14 it's... is just like a wasteland. Like there's not a single <laughs> thing happening. Yeah. <laughs> and I decided to look at the... Um, and this is kind of where roster construction has made no sense. And I, I don't want to stay on this too long because we do have other teams to talk about. Because <laughs> you're but... about to get your credential pulled. <laughs> <laughs> A second time. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) let's anyway, I decided to check out like where the ball was going, you know, whenever they got to around that area and they kept putting it out wide because that's where this team is built on wingers. And that's great. Except who are they going to cross the ball into? Enzo. Your option (laughs) is Enzo Martinez. Noted. They is five, eight. And like, that's who you're trying to cross the ball into. And then it it doesn't make sense. If you're relying on your inverted wingers to cut inside and score goals for you, that might have been that might have worked when you could be MLS2 merchants, but not in this current USL. It's just too competitive of a league. And next week on Hammering Roots. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> me me and Kaylor noted Oakland Roots supporters uh since day one. From the very beginning. I yeah. But we're not gonna talk about that Oakland game, and that's probably a good thing for our sponsors sponsorship reasons. What Oakland game? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't worse than the Birmingham game. That's an upgrade for me. That's like, true. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, let's move on. And with moving on, let's go ahead and 45 minutes into the show, let's get into this USL tactics show. Why don't we? 
maybe. Come on. I sell that tactic show where today I want to talk about the Tampa Bay Rowdies and the way that they were able to change their shape at halftime in order to gain surety against a really fierce Rhode Island FC team. Now, early on, as you're seeing, Tampa Bay pressed in a 3-4-3 shape, one that gave them parity in theory against the back three of Rhode Island, but in actuality left them a little bit unshielded in terms of the midfield and the protection for their back line. You see how they're holding a fairly high back line and how Aaron Guillen is forced to step up from that left center back spot in order to intervene. He was successful there, but that wasn't always the case for Tampa Bay. Here, Albert Dickwa gets in behind over Forrest Lasso being a little bit slow. Now compare that to what we saw in the second half. Tampa Bay moved into more of a 3-5-2, putting on Josh Perez as an attacking midfielder who played halfway between the center mids and that forward line. Here, Perez is roving in the press. He's denying Rhode Island the ability to simply play over the top and win a knockdown. Because Perez is there between the lines, the other midfielders for Tampa Bay were able to sit deeper, and that really caused troubles for Rhode Island. You're seeing how, in that first example, Perez played a role in the press, and here he's linking play, finding chances between the lines, and really allowing the wingbacks to get involved and players like Manuel Arteaga, who are gifted as rovers beyond their goal scoring, to be maximized within the context of the Rowdies' offense. This was a game where Tampa Bay really needed to prove something, where they needed to show that they are a contender in a stronger Eastern Conference, and as you're seeing with the way that they adjusted in this second half, continued to find chances because of those tactical shifts, they absolutely made that statement. Here, Perez is actually pressing up to the goalie, but again, look at him drop back, find a shot for himself, but instead pass it up and create opportunities. This is flow. This is evolution. This is what Robbie Nielsen wants to see for this Rowdy's team going forward. So Rhode Island for kind of the first time, gets absolutely smacked in the mouth. And I want to be interested to see how they recover. But, hey, Tampa Bay comes out, and they look like what we thought Tampa Bay would look like. And Robbie Nielsen gets his really first signature win. And it kind of like what you we've talked about in the past, it does kind of remind me of ye olden days where the embryo was, you know, <laughs> flowing freely down there in the, the trop. That's they're not in the trop, but you get the point. That would be insane if they <laughs> if they played in Tropicana Field. That would be the most unhinged thing ever. <laughs> I uh... you had baseball, <laughs> hockey, and football there. Um hockey? yeah, I I think like it's it's funny because we talk about two games that in theory are like really heavy defeats, but Rhode Island I think do come away from this one feeling probably a lot better about themselves than Legion uh, in in the other game. We're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> we were done. <laughs> um, it's a juxtaposition, Kaylor. It's a juxtaposition. Um, I I think what. My mental sanity? <laughs> exactly. Rhode Island fans. This is not what Rhode Island fans look like. Rhode Island fans <laughs> look happy. <laughs> no, I'm just... This no, is so, your brain on Legion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, I think I think in general, like, you, you did really well there, John, to, like, point out the tactical switch because watching the game, it was so stark, like, how Rhode Island did like quite easily like get their way in the first half it wasn't that they had complete domination or anything you wouldn't expect them to at al lang but they were able to do what they wanted which was soak up some pressure play out from the back and then launch some of those balls over the top obviously one falls to the to the feet of dickwa to be able to to go and bind and score which i'm sure he will do a lot for them this season um but this was a little bit of i think maybe Kano Smith learning a lesson to like from someone who, you know, this is his first season in professional management, like as the guy. Um, and I think he gets a little outfoxed here um, by a more experienced manager. Obviously Nielsen is still like blooding himself at Tampa Bay, but I think in general, like he's uh, he, him making that change just did like, kind of highlight the one thing that Rhode Island is in the process of, which is there is a lot of learning going on, 
both at like an organizational level and at the more tactical level. Um, I, I think Kano will definitely like take this one for what it is, which is a, a lesson learned. Um, they were a little bit naive. Obviously, there's a couple of bad mistakes, like the Cal Jennings, the Cal Jennings goal is just a defensive error, like, and those will happen. Um, so I think if you're gonna have a night like this, away at the rowdies is not like the worst place to have it because hey, you can take it on the chin and then it's like we just we go again next week. Yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, it's a way of, yeah, go ahead. It's a way at the Rowdies early season, too. Like, yeah. I, I think the only thing that I wanted to point out was the instant karma of the Rhode Island goal of the goal kicking the ball and the fans laughing at him and he falls over and ends up like straight in a goal. It was just like immediate <laughs> instant sports karma. Um, that's what that's that's the one thing that stood out to me. I mean, aside of all the tactical things that John brought up, but that I totally picked up on. Um, it was it was the goal kick laugh and media goal that I was just like, that is. <laughs> what was interesting for me for Tampa Bay was uh, very rarely do we see them playing from behind in so frequently. In fact, this is the first time in 210 days that they won a match from conceding the opening goal of that match. That last one was on September 2nd of last year against the Hartford Athletics, so another team from the New England uh, area, but yeah, it's interesting with how Rhode Island's going to approach their next game because it certainly doesn't let up. I mean, you're now playing the defending Eastern Conference champions in the Charleston Battery, maybe coming to town, and that's certainly not one that uh, you want to take lightly. I think the thing that's been interesting approach wise with Rhode Island is that they're a team that's not afraid to play it long. And it's in pursuit of trying to pin their opponent back and maintain territory, like keep the ball in that attacking half of the field. And the way that Tampa Bay neutralized that by dropping their central midfield a little, little bit deeper, I don't really know what the counterpunch would be if you are Kano. And that's why he's the manager of this team and he knows what he's doing stylistically. I, I do think some of the squad selection has been intriguing to a degree. Like this was a game where you knew the Rowdies were going to come out and press. He makes a change in the back line going with Clay Holstad instead of Frank Nadarce. Holstad is not really a passer, and you've got Gabriel Alves sitting there. It's pretty clear he sees Alves as a center back at this point. That would have been my call. I think some of the choices he's made in the midfield, like you've got a pretty deep and talented roster. I love what I'm seeing with the philosophy. I just want to see him use the depth that this team has to a greater degree to try and kind of adapt based on the matchup. You, you kind of speak on uh, Gabriel Alves just kind of sitting there, by the way. Um, this was the first game where I can remember them really properly go into a three-man back line. Uh, they've kind of flirted with it, but this game they uh, Rhode Island went for that three back. And if you're looking at Gabriel Alves, he is he was a center mid in college, played fullback at the professional level last year. If you're looking for a ball playing center back, you kind of put those two things together. He can do a real job for you there. So I kind of I do understand where that one's coming from. Not to rub salt into my own wounds, but you're also about to get Colin Smith involved as well. And that's going to open up a lot more possibilities for you as a team if you're Rhode Island. So if you're looking at where do you go next, you have reinforcements coming, reinforcements who are used to the league. I think that I wouldn't panic at all if you're Rhode Island. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think this might be the last game. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk Indy versus Detroit. Indy comes out hot, but dear Lord, Detroit is relentless. And the number one fear I always had was, man, what if Detroit knew how to score? <laughs> that show has taught them how to score, and their defense still looks really good. They are a problem. I would like to thank Detroit City for letting me win a parlay with that uh, late goal. I totally wasn't sweating uh, that match at all, so thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep saying it. Ryan is sinking into degeneracy every passing week. 
<laughs> We're gonna have to make a scroll on the stream yard of the gambling like hotline or like gambling addiction hotline. Um I uh I think there are a couple sliding doors moments in this match. Nate Steinwasher closed those sliding doors in in some respects, but I do want to focus primarily on how the signing of Ali Coot has made this Detroit City like offense so much more functional without changing a whole ton in terms of like the shape or even the patterns, but that signing and Maxi Rodriguez being able to move up in a place where he can link up with both Coot and Elvis Amo has made this team like just make so much more sense when they're in attack. And obviously the the goal, the first goal comes directly from that link up um, and just some composure on the edge of the area from Maxi Rodriguez to find to find Coot through on goal. He is basically like the Hopano like of this year in that like it's the only th it's the thing that makes all of the rest of it make sense um and so yeah I mean credit to Detroit City for going and finding a player that can that can really stitch together like the rest of of their build up um and obviously I think Steinwasher comes up big in this one the last shout out I'll give is Yunus Budati's ass assist on the first goal is absolutely disgusting uh like the the dribble into the box but for Indy I think unfortunately you see like two you see Jack Blake essentially trying to do what Ali Coot does for Detroit City it, like out on that left wing position for Sean McCauley and uh yeah Coot gets the better of him in this one but and I know it took a late goal um and some goalkeeping heroics but uh Detroit City finding a way on the road in a game that I don't think they win in any scenario last year mm -mm. I you know it John you kind of put it in the ether and I don't I'm not gonna say you backtracked because you definitely didn't but you know yeah. you said that Nate was uh, GK won in the league and, you know, kind of said, you know, you know, GK, you know, one B and all that. Nate is clear. Number one for me. Like I love Paul Blanchett, but yeah, Nate, but the, take, yeah the take was Nate one, a Blanchett one B like Nate's the guy, but yeah, keep going on that. I, I don't even think it's a one, a conversation. I think it's one, two, like it is to what Nate provides in terms of what, because what Paul is really good at is shot stopping, but not bad at. He's better than me, duh. But like, there's a lot of rebounds. He's really freaking good at parrying the ball. He's really good at just getting his body in front of the ball. But there's always a, a few rebounds and a couple opportunities. I'm not saying he drops anything. That's not what I mean. But Nate always seems to save and catch. Like it always feels like if he gets a paw to it, it's not going out for a corner that the threat stops there. And what he provides with, you know, with possession and passing distribution, it's not Rocco. It's not Rocco Rios Novo, but it's good for what Detroit needs him to do. He's my easy GK one easy. Yeah, and while we're going around and just shouting out Detroit players, how about James Murphy in that midfield? Yeah. Like, he's been so unbelievably good. They're playing with essentially a two-man midfield at times, just given the fact that Maxi is so far up. And Lijop and uh, Murphy have been unbelievably good. In Indy 11, a lot of the times we're going with a pretty tight diamond defensively. They dropped Guanzati deeper into the midfield. And Murphy never really sweat against that shape. Like he's been incredibly impressive coming over from Monterey. Somebody who's been a linchpin for this team who I don't think I looked at him as a huge signing. Like I looked at him as maybe a piece that would get some games in rotation, but not be this vital to the system, but blown me away. It is and a it is a bit of a theme too that we're seeing, I think, in the league that like the midfield has made the difference in a lot of games and there's a lot of teams that didn't prioritize like going out and getting difference makers in midfield and it's showing early in the season. 
That is not a shot at Legion. That is a shot at my own team. <laughs> that is a shot at my own team. That was the tornado siren that got came out here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I why, again, while we're just, you know, guys will just name random Detroit City players, you know, that that so, whole yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Brett Levis is disgustingly good. Mm-hmm. Oh my well, god. Yeah. Well, this was also, the important choice lineup wise in this game was going with Reese Williams on that right wing. If you can fault Detroit at all this year, it's been the fact that that Levis Coot combination has been kind of the only source of offense at times. Having somebody who can serve in a ball on his right foot and really stretch the other side of the pitch, totally crucial to the way they broke down Indy late on. Also, we, um, last we year we had. This- did we get all the starting 11? Is there a player that I need to shout out so we don't get like hate mail from that player's parents or something from the I'm on the podcast? Uh, we never say anything about Michael Bryant. So notoriously good He's cornhole cute. player. Let's move on. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank Mustache you, Mustache King. Yeah. Mustache King. I, I honestly, oh my God, there's the, the one person we didn't name or the two people we didn't name was would have been my vote for MVP of of Amu Mensa and the actual player of the week, Maxi Rodriguez. Just the two players we didn't mention. <laughs> so we just kind of go. assume Maxi is going to be amazing. Like we take we take Maxi for granted. We do kind of take Maxi for granted. Also, really nice guy. I just want to throw that out there. Like when they came to Birmingham last year, he was he wasn't in the starting 11. I was like, Maxi, you okay? And he was like, yeah, got a little knock. I, I might play. I might not. I'll see how I feel. And I'm like, okay, cool. Good for you, Maxi. <laughs> Good for you. All right. Um, By the way, I, this is not really on the table for us to talk about, but kind of thinking about Brett Levis. Um, FC Tulsa. I They might wish they had him right now. <laughs> Just ah, it's, it's two games into the season. Hard to tell, but uh, anything on they. Uh, I mean, they had they did have an issue of like Goodrum just kind of got hurt in warmups, and then Rishi today got hurt like twenty minutes into the game. I still think that the fact that they signed about half of their starters in the two weeks before the season because like Mario Sanchez just wanted his guys that is going to lead to a slow start. The fact that they really haven't been able to, well, they've not designed their system around Arthur Rogers, which is kind of what they ought to have done given that they got Arthur Rogers. And then they also lost Kelly and Charlie Adams late in the off season. Like that left it as the clear option. I think that there is a lot of meat on the bone of the roster and they're not gnawing at it. Tulsa, yeah. Tulsa also create a pretty decent amount in this match. And yeah. I would say in general, OC has ridden Colin Shuttler to like a very good start to the season uh, to a certain extent. Um, that being said, I know John talked about it in his sub stack and I, I've been talking about it early season, just not. Well, I did write one preseason article that mentioned Sophie and Jafal but my god like he just really looks like uh, like I know we've been waxing lyrical about him but he he really does look like he's a unique player in the league because there aren't many many players with his level of close control and the ability to just just drive the ball forward on the dribble plus combined with crazy technique in terms of passing and as we found out this weekend shooting as well He's a guy who started 20 games as a rookie in MLS, and then like he's just in the USL now because Austin didn't know what to do with him after he had a little bit of an injury. Uh, real quick, a shout out to Andy there in the comments because he did indeed kind of force my hand. I realized I'm only talking about Eastern teams way too often, so shout out to the entirety of the West Coast. And for... Uh... And for at least uh, Tulsa's next three games aren't any aren't going to get any easier with Phoenix, Sacramento, and Charleston uh, consecutively, and this week being their first home opener. But luckily, uh, Doctor Locomotive and Legion come after those three games. I hate this sport. Um, <laughs> so 
Joaquin Rivas might be healthy by then, so. <laughs> Watch Maybe out. we'll find the hum- we'll find the hum- boy at Tori by then, wherever he is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like that'll fix anything. Um, let's go ahead and get to some predictions. Um, let's go ahead. I want to start off with New Mexico versus El Paso. Um, one of the best rivalries this that this league has to offer. If you aren't watching it, you should. Like. This has this was feisty from day one, and it has remained that way. New Mexico off to a really good start. Um, we could have talked about their performance uh, this last week as well, but we did not. El Paso gets the week off to re- to recoup after playing seventeen matches in three days or whatever it was, um, and this could be the restart that El Paso needed while New Mexico is running hot. Allen starts us off. Um, I think I was slow to recognize uh, New Mexico as being like a team this year. I was like still stuck in last year of maybe not the best team. Uh, and I was a little bit slow on their uptick. So I'm going to say that they're going to re- ride their hot hand in and take the win here. Ryan? Looking back through the uh, previous two seasons, and oddly enough, the road team has won each of the last four games of this series, but I have to back uh, New Mexico to break that trend this week with a victory. Phil? Yeah, I, I uh, Albuquerque and... Uh, the way the form is right now, I have to go. I have to go with a New Mexico win um, against my against my fandom. But there's just they've just got it together um, quicker than than Locomotive have. The fresh legs and the week off, I'm thinking, will mean that Locomotive look a lot more serious than they did against Vegas. Um, but I don't know that it'll be enough to get them over the hump. John. Yeah, I think that the New Mexico press has a way of shutting down teams that are going to try to work the ball on the ground into their forward line. Doesn't necessarily bode well for the locomotive here, so go on New Mexico. I am also taking New Mexico. Let's go ahead and go down to South Beach, and let's talk about Miami, who, hey, hey, maybe Miami's legit, with Hartford, who I will just say it, they are legit. This should be a fun one down on the South Beach. Alan. Rest in peace, Alan, maybe. Hey, there I am. Hey, uh, hi. Much like that performance, uh, last season, I think this is a game people avoid watching. Uh, I think this season has a lot more in tree, but I'm, I'm still going with, with Hartford on this one. Ryan. You're muted, Ryan. Rest in peace. Sorry. I'm thinking Hartford on this one, despite going a uh, goalless against Miami and their two meetings last season. I feel like this is a different Hartford athletic team and I'm going to back them for the win. I think these teams actually have retained like one player between both of them, which is actually <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Just complete transformation. Um, I I went Hartford too. There was a part of me that almost put draw just because there's something about this Hartford side early on that makes it seem like they might be vulnerable to Miami's like park the bus mentality. Um I think they'll have enough to to get it over the line, but I do think Miami, if they have shown us anything, Miami have shown us that they at least know how to play as a team. Um, And I think that is going to give Hartford some fits, but I do, I do still back Hartford to win it. John. I think Miami is kind of designed in a lab to, deny what Hartford wants to do. And I think that they have the ingredients to like navigate on the counter and be gritty like that. I think after Hartford had a really frustrating game against North Carolina, they're going to come out with a little bit of fire and go and get this win. However, 
I'm taking Harper. A lot of this comes down to Jay Chapman, uh, Anderson Asadu, and Mitch Galina, Deshaun Beckford. I there those four can change a game individually, and I just believe in what they're kind of cooking out there right now. So I am taking Hartford. Um, sneaky fun game of the weekend: Las Vegas versus San Antonio. <laughs> Uh, San Antonio fans are going to hate me, but I, I'm picking them. Uh, uh, John wrote a really great uh, piece about how um, Mr. Lambert has has added, so I want to shout him out on that, um, has added a piece to San, San Antonio. Um, I would like to see Vegas do well because when Vegas is playing well, it makes the West way more interesting because there are no like, you know, ugly-headed stepchild uh, on the West Coast. They, they're further east now um but there's no like walk there's less walkovers in the west uh with vegas playing well and so that's what i'm hoping for uh, is a everyone has a great time always run did anyone bet at the start of the year that las vegas would have i no no pun intended I, it's, it's you did. <laughs> did anyone think at the anyone? start of the year that Las Vegas would have more clean sheets at some point in the year than San Antonio would because Las Vegas is off the back of two clean sheets in a row, something they haven't done since 2022. But I still think San Antonio is the better side. They've scored two goals in each of their first four games right now, and they should likely get the win here this weekend. Oh. I'm probably I'm probably cooking a little bit too much here, but I'm really buying a lot of what lights are selling uh and and i'm i'm going for a draw um in this one i think it'll be an entertaining game um but yeah i i just i think i think lights might have something uh like not not anything i'm not saying they're going to be like top of the west or anything like that but i think they are actually cooking something out there and i think they grab a point yeah like there's something about that midfield with Valentin Noel, JC Nagando, and especially Coleman Gannon. Like, I would go to war for that guy. He's kind of <laughs> short. He's constantly being annoying in the press. He's my kind of, like, hybrid forward midfielder. I think against this San Antonio team who feels like they've had a good 60 minutes every time out but haven't quite been able to hold it wholly together san antonio is going to really bring it in this one against fabian garcia and get the dub i wrote down las vegas and erased it several times because i in my head i was like lads it's las vegas um but i think i might have wrote san antonio but i think i changed my mind again i'm taking las vegas i just really buy into it i really do i don't get me wrong. I also really like what San, Ant uh, San Antonio is doing, but yeah, I I'm really loving what Las Vegas is cooking up. Let's Joe, go, to Joe Joe and uh, Juan Agudelo on the pitch, uh, like Paul Rudd at Hot <laughs> Ones. Like who who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh speaking of who would have thought, um Central Valley, they uh they did they did some things and then Richmond actually got a win um tonight. Uh US Open Cup bizarre penalty that should not have been a penalty and then you know one of the most bizarre I'm passing it to you when playing out of the back goes wrong like it, one of the wildest ones i've ever seen and then a by the way a banger from maryland that was gross and hey, i'll just killing it yeah yeah former yeah. dcf dcfc yeah so um yeah let's go ahead and get into richmond versus uh central valley Oh, I had a tough one with this one, but I'm going with Chaos and picking Fuego. Ryan? 
these teams last season combined for 18 goals in each of their meetings last year. I mean, you know, while we're looking at a Richmond team who are coming off the back of two Open Cup victories, I still want to point out that they haven't won a game in a USL League One regular season since July 1st of last season, which is still counting 276 days ago. I'm picking a draw out of this one. Yeah, I, I went for I went for chaos draw. Um, I think I think this is like four four or something stupid like that. Yeah, I'm I'm was thinking this was gonna be like the okay, we're here, we can do the thing, win for Richmond, and then they kind of did that tonight in the open, which cut undercuts my narrative. I still think they're just straight up the better team than Fuego, like what we're seeing with a ton of long balls and Siobhan John Brown getting on the end of flick ons is kind of smoke and mirrors from Jermaine Jones. So give me the kickers. I kind of thought that everybody for Richmond was like hurt. So today, the fact that, I mean, obviously it's still out, but I just thought everybody was like kind of just dead. So I took Fuego, but after seeing tonight, I'm not as certain on that but there's also just something about west coast chaos that i don't know i buy into that somewhat like it's it's there i'm i'm buying into it just a bit so i guess i'll take central valley for the vibes uh, but uh let's end it uh just like they are going to be ending it on cbs for those uh for the sports I, all the letters proximity Association, con Louisville, whatever. Indianapolis. Wait. Proximity. <laughs> Prox Proximity. <laughs> Proximity Association Football Contest. It's the oldest one. All I know is that's the oldest competition in the history of the universe. Alan, on CBS, what you got? Blue City. Ryan? If there's a pivotal moment in this match, I really want the announcer to say this one is for all the letters <laughs> like you just did, <laughs> Kaylor, but Louisville City in a lock. Phil? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, you'd be a very, very bold man to bet against Lou City at this point. Um, so, yeah, I'm going Lou. I don't know if y'all have seen the, I think it's an official trophy that it's like a traffic cone with, the I-65 sign in it. And I mean, hey, that's a, a highway I've been on more than anything else in my entire life. So this is this is my game. I'm excited for it. And I, I think it's not going to be close. I've got loose city in a lock. It's always funny that interstates are as long as they are because I-65 is also the yeah. interstate that I've also been on the most, which is it's just funny how long interstates are. Yeah, it's, it's that loose the city. Point of, isn't that the point of <laughs> interstates is they traverse multiple except states. like some Don't of them, talk about except, that. except like <laughs> some of them are like not that long like some of them are pretty short and it freaks me out um really so makes you think <laughs> um let's uh you know for me i almost went with indy because last year uh, indy had the shock win in lynn family as well and I thought, could they do it twice? But I, honestly, if I came out here and said that Indy is going to beat Indy is going to beat Loose City, I would just seem like just a straight up hater, and I can't do that. Um, so yeah, I have to I have to take Loose City. Um, I think that's it. Any, they beat you into submission. Is that why you picked them? Like they like they've ruined you. You are reek now from Game of Thrones. Is that what's happening? <laughs> It's only the worst loss since 2019, and it's okay. Everything's fine. Anyway, I might not have nightmares about it later. We'll find out. I'll call my therapist. All right. Any final USL thoughts? Anything? I think by that analogy, I would always have to pick Phoenix because they like literally murdered my club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> oh, I've got I've got a USL thought. Go read okay. every go read everything the protagonist is putting out, but especially Phil's recaps. Yeah, they're, and read all of John's stuff because holy cow, he's doing the most. <laughs> like, <laughs> the 
the best way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always good stuff. I think it was um, Ross in, you know, uh, USL League yeah. One Review – I uh, end up kind of just talking about it a little bit as well about how much just good content there is in the USL right now. He says specifically in League One, which yes, the League One content game is ridiculous right now. Um, but also just in general, there's so much good USL content out there. Go, go follow all of it. And if there's an episode that you like, go like tag them in it. Or if there's something that you read that you like, quote it. Share it around, tag them in it because your love and appreciation for it. I can guarantee you there's at least once or twice a day as they are writing or recording whatever it is that they are thinking about quitting it and closing up shop. So spread them that love because it gets hard. <laughs> it does get hard to keep doing it. So sh show them love. So, um, yeah, I think that's about. I, I love you, Keeler. I love you. Thank, thank you, Alan. I love you too. I, I'm, I'm hurt, but I will, I will eventually, I'll finish, eventually grow. Um, yeah. Final thoughts for the night. Let's go back to the love, Alan. Uh, which with your tattoo, I think that means you are the biggest Carolina Core fan in the world. <laughs> 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 yeah um yeah hopefully everyone had a nice uh trans day of visibility on on sunday and didn't get mad that it happened to be on easter even though trans day of visibility has been the 31st for like seemingly ever um yeah just uh be kind to each other out there folks the the, the banter is one thing but when i went down to it like I, I just wanted to give Kaler a giant hug afterwards and tell him everything will be all right because <laughs> everything will be all right because he's teaching, he's making a difference in people's lives on a daily basis. And I know his kids absolutely adore him. Uh, most of his kids absolutely adore him. Uh, you're not yeah, going to win them all, Never going to win them all. But uh, it, one another out there, folks. Love you. Ryan? I don't often shout out like just other just random YouTube videos that I watch, but one of my favorite movie reviewers, uh, Shafreyas, Shafreyas Productions, did a review on Megamind Two and the subsequent TV show that hit uh, Peacock. For the reference, it was an hour long review, and for reference, the Megamind Two is currently at nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So, <laughs> if you want to like just have something to just go and laugh at for a while, it's a great video and a fantastic watch. There was a second one. <laughs> that that was like a lot of the point that he was making for uh, that uh, review. Ah, okay. It just Phil. hit Peacock, by the way. <laughs> All right, Phil. Um, yeah, I uh, this past weekend, I I don't have any good like show or anything recommendations but this past weekend i was uh with my family my sister and her husband just moved into their first house so they that was exciting we were spending the weekend together and uh on a random whim uh me and my family made uh cuban food uh so we did some cubanos and we did i actually by hand which you might be able to still see on my thumb peeled uh plantains and made tostones and uh like a garlic cilantro um like dipping sauce as well and when i tell you it was the best uh potential way to eat ham on an easter weekend um yeah highly recommend so um yeah and we did a little like uh like black bean uh like thing as well so we just yeah went for it and if you're if you have a cuban restaurant near you uh patronize it that sounds unreal <laughs> <laughs> it was sick actually uh peeling plantains is harder than you would think though uh yeah, and as a fun. as a white man it did not it did not come naturally to me but i through you know through hard work and determination i did eventually figure it out i i destroyed so many plantains trying to make fried plantains uh, about a, a few weeks ago and like it was just an absolute slaughtering of perfectly good food <laughs> John yeah um, 
I guess this weekend I started uh, watching Twin Peaks for the first time and I'm just loving it so far. Like it's, it's weird. It's funnier than I thought it was going to be. So excited to dig into what's going to end up being about three seasons of that. Nice. Um, I made actually talking about just stuff that's not your t typical, well, um, American household meal, white person meal, if we're being honest. I made pho, actually, um, which surprisingly easier than I thought it was going to be. Granted, I probably made it way wrong. So everybody who's like ever had pho would be like, you made beef broth, pal. But I thought it was very good. Um, so that was fun. I've never actually cooked with rice noodles before. So much better than normal noodles mm -hmm. that I'm used to. That's what I've learned. So, yeah. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah. So the takeaway take from the USL show today is expand your pasta horizons. <laughs> and part of our new merch is going to be a USL show cookbook, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am being very serious when I say this. I, I am working on a Google form to send to every club in the USL with asking players what their like favorite childhood meal was. And if they have a recipe, cause like I am currently working on that because I'm so intrigued, especially cause there's a lot of guys that are not from the U S or even stuff. I never thought about not all parts of the U S eat the same kind of food. And, you know, as someone who has been stuck in my own Southeast bubble for all of my life, the fact that not everybody just grew up on, well, grease and collards is insane to me. So like, I'm so intrigued and I cannot wait to actually send that out. <laughs> so you said yeah, Southeast you... and like, I want shrimp and grits now. <laughs> I was trying to if there was a joke about killer whales and okra or not in there somewhere. <laughs> There's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's there. It's it's there. Yeah, we'll if workshop you're dyslexic, it. Yeah. Oh, oh, okra, <laughs> fried okra. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, you speak. Speaking of the uh, teaching, by the way, Alan um, had a kid walk up to me and was like, "Hey, I think you. Uh, I think my soldering came loose on my trumpet, which I had already resoldered his trumpet. So I was like, there's no way that happened. I just fixed that. He ripped the lead pipe out of the, the instrument, <laughs> which I was like, that's not coming loose. You broke it. <laughs> like That's broken. <laughs> there's a picture on my Twitter. If anybody is interested, I it's, gross and i'm really mad about it because i i spent time on a soldering gun fixing it but and, and, and when just, he says gross it means like a part of an instrument bro like it's not gory or anything yeah 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 yeah. hold on because <laughs> i can because this really matters now and this to totally Cont matters. <laughs> content warning graphic <laughs> pictures <laughs> yeah we're gonna get our sponsorships pulled for this <laughs> um if it's by holton maybe because this should not happen to a Holton. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen that happen quite a few. Because if one soldering breaks, the whole lead pipe is going to go. It's going to yeah. go. If you're looking at this, the the kid got his mouthpiece stuck in in the instrument. And despite the, the form that's sent home, that said, if something happens to your instrument, just leave it there and bring it to me. I can fix it. They said... Nah, we're hard working people from the country. We can fix a little piece of metal. They broke it. <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> I'm so mad. It's fine. Everything's fine. I'm getting it fixed. Anyway. Maybe they're just trying to create a blow dart thing. Like they're Ooh. <laughs> trying to they get a, they're trying to get an experimental sound uh with with that trumpet. Just trying to experiment, find something new. You know, in college, we had my horn professor had a lead pipe that was just that, and he would make you play on it every now and then because it made you figure out if you were using air effectively. So it's actually a 
common practice tool, but not for a fifth grader. Sure, so. I'm sure. He <laughs> I'm sure that was what he told you. That's what he told me. Yeah. Anyway, that that was that. Um, hey, can you stop messing with my blinds? God, it's stupid cat. I'm I'm glad we got Kayler just kind of talking to his cat before the episode ended. <laughs> Had to get there. Had to get there. He's like 10 <laughs> seconds from wrapping up and nah, not <laughs> to talk to the cat. <laughs> it's not an episode until he talks to the cat. Uh, yeah, pretty much. The best part is Kayler doesn't, doesn't actually own a cat. <laughs> the cats always happen to be off camera, just conveniently yeah. off camera. It's just moving the curtain. <laughs> I love the idea of somebody who's an hour and a half into this podcast and can't see a thing that's going on and is like, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> If they made it an hour and a half, then they should be used to this at this point. Um. <laughs> they are just suffering from auditory hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before I know, I'm not going to get it. No, I've already talked enough. Anyway, thank you all so much for listening. It has been an absolute blast to have everyone back. Hopefully uh, this next week is nice, fun and chaotic because it's always best when it's that way. Thank you all so much for listening and for the last time tonight. Here's Alan's voice. Thank you for watching another episode of the USL Show. The USL Show is now proudly part of the Protagonist Podcast family. Please go to protagonistsoccer.com to check out more work. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time.